You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you with Paul Gardner and Todd Wood. Now, you mentioned uh, a moment ago uh, the fact that obviously um, when we're dealing with what animals went on the ark, we're really talking about terrestrial air-breathing animals and flying things. We're talking about birds, mammals, reptiles, those kinds of things. Yeah. And we're not talking about fish. (laughs) Right. But some people then raise a kind of corollary to this. They say, okay, if the fish weren't on the ark, there's still a problem, right? Because we have the oceans covering the land and presumably all of the salt water and fresh water kind of gets mixed up. So how did salt water and fresh water fish survive in this kind of uh, yeah. mixture of waters of different salinities outside of the ark? How right. did they survive? Right. Yeah. And, and it's not just the fish, right? It's, it's, there are many, there are many aquatic organisms and marine organisms that have very sensitive uh, tolerance to, to mm. their particular preferred salinity. Right. So there's, there are creatures that just absolutely have to have what we think of as fresh water. Um, there are creatures that are able to live in brackish water, which is when the fresh water comes in and mixes with the salt water of the ocean and creates this sort of mixture of water. And then you have things that really only are going to live in the, in the salt water. Um, and that, to me, again, kind of goes back to this notion of, you know, how do we have to save every variety of creature? Um, and yeah, again, back, going back to the 1600s, people recognize that when you, when you bring creatures to a new environment, there's, there's going to be some acclimatization and some adaptation and they're going to change a little bit. Uh, and sometimes maybe a lot of it. Um, (laughs) and so when I look at the, 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 the question of how do creatures sort of survive the mixing of the flood. So the question that comes to my mind is, well, what is the scale of the problem, right? How many, how many species out there have really narrow salinity tolerance, right? Really narrow tolerance for the kind of water that they live in. And then, uh, do they have things that are very similar to them that might be a little more tolerant and a little more open to different salinities. Uh, so that's one way of thinking about it. Maybe this, the sorts of the, the critters we see today that have that narrow tolerance are simply, you know, inheriting thousands of years of, of mutations or whatever that have rendered them, you know, very narrowly restricted to whatever environment they find themselves in. Yeah. Another possible answer to that is to think about, you know, what is the nature of the flood? Uh, and I think for some reason we tend to think that the flood is this, we tend to think of the flood in very static terms of, you know, we have, here's the land and then water comes up over it and all the water gets mixed together and everything around gets all mixed together. So we should expect to see everything all jumbled up and mixed together and deposited everywhere. And there should be no order. There should be no sense to the flood at all. And I think you and I both know that does not seem to be what we see in the fossil record, right? So that conception of the flood seems to be quite wrong. And so then I wonder, well, is it possible then that you could have regions of the planet thinking in, you know, globally, globally scaled here where you could have water pockets that are not mixing very well. And we know if you do, you know, certain temperature, uh, mixing of, of water with of different temperatures or mixing different salinities of water that they don't actually mix very well sometimes if you if you do it well and do it right well salt water is more dense than fresh water right right so, so fresh water tends to float on top of salt water right and particularly if during a, an event like the flood you had enormous quantities of rainfall i could imagine that you're constantly replenishing a kind of fresh water layer at the top of the the, the flood water column exactly um, exactly and so, i th- i think you know we don't have a good analog today for no. understanding what a global flood is like no. so i think people sometimes make very simplistic assumptions about mm-hmm. the flood yeah um and i 
we, we need to question whether those simplistic assumptions actually represent reality. Right. And I think the flood was an extraordinarily complex um, and multifaceted event. Complex and, as you say, without real precedent today. Um, the kinds of floods that we experience today don't come anywhere near covering mm-hmm. even uh, a single, like a single European country or a single state in the United States. Our, you know, really big floods, uh, the tsunami, tsunamis that we've seen or, or experienced, um, those, they're, and I don't want to be flippant about this, but they are fairly transient. They're very quick. Uh, devastating, obviously, horrifying. Um, but in terms of you know the large scale of things, they don't do that much. Uh, not like what the Bible describes as the flood. So, yeah, the flood does not. It, it's not like a river overflowing its banks or a tsunami hitting a, a country. It's something much, much bigger, and it has to have a much bigger explanation and i think what you said about um organisms today that have these very narrow um tolerances for a range of salinities the fact that they are in effect specialized descendants of perhaps organisms at the time of the flood that were more generalized and it may be that other members of their same kind can tolerate a wider range of salinities right and the other thing uh, that i think is quite interesting is even some marine organisms today that if you t- took them immediately from their environment, dropped them into fresh water, they would just die. There's a kind of shock, you know, and they, yeah. they just die. But actually some organisms, if you gradually acclimatize them to a new salinity and you don't do it suddenly, you suddenly find the survival rate goes up. So again, you know, there's, a, you know, possibly some of these organisms were able to survive because they were gradually introduced to water of a different salinity and not suddenly. And that's, There's all kinds of factors. It's a very complex Yeah, it is a very subject, complex thing. And, and, and that's a really important point too, because we don't have to have every individual survive the flood. No. We just have to have basically two of every kind, right? Of yeah. fish or whatever. And we know that lots of aquatic life died during the flood because yeah, so because much of the fossil of record fossils. is of marine life. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> most of fossil, most of the fossil record yeah. is marine. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, we know that not everything survived and yeah, yeah, that's it. This is a really, it's kind of a can of worms that we're opening here because there's so many possibilities. And, uh, as I recall, I don't remember a lot of creationists doing work in this area of freshwater survival, except pointing out certain, the sorts of things that we've pointed out here. It would be nice if we had, more solid answers if we could get some more modeling and some um, studies of uh, fish created kinds and so forth to be able to sort of get a bit more concrete um, answers to, to when people ask this question. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at coreside.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.